be careful, little hands, what you do. We had people come to our house and go, what is that smell? <laughs> oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Forget the water, take care of the toe. For the Father up above is looking down in love. I haven't eaten for four days. So be careful, little hands, what you do. <laughs> what does God want? That question has haunted men and women down through ages. What does God want? Another way to say that is, what is God's will? What is God's will? I used to think of God's will as something bad. You know, that's traditional. We think that God's will is something we won't enjoy. It's something bad. I used to be afraid to talk to God about whom I would marry because I was afraid that he had some wrinkled uh, bratwurst waiting for me somewhere. I didn't think he wanted me to marry anyone appealing or someone that was pretty or someone that I had a desire for. I was sure that he had a little surprise for me. He would open a little box and say, look at that. <laughs> Isn't it funny that we assume that God wants for us something less than what would bring us fulfillment and life and joy and happiness. I used to have an idea that God had, um, that his will, for instance, he had a, a wife picked out for me. And it was some nasty, distorted person somewhere because it was God's will. It certainly couldn't be a beautiful woman. That couldn't be God's will. It couldn't be someone I enjoyed being with. It couldn't be an appealing woman, someone I was attracted to. Certainly God wouldn't want fulfillment and enjoyment and uh, he wouldn't want anything like that for me. God's will was nasty. But he gave me a beautiful wife. A lady who makes me laugh harder than I will ever make you laugh. She is the most hilarious. We're walking down the street. A man came up to us and said, I haven't eaten for four days. And Diane said, I'd give my right arm for that kind of discipline. <laughs> I'm going to wait a little while. Some of you are just catching on there to what that means. Oh, she keeps me on my toes. But the question of God's will is a question that keeps us perplexed. I've lost track of the number of times I've sat with someone uh, uh, sitting across the table or across the desk from me agonizing over what God's will was. Where should I go to school? What job should I take? And tonight we're going to take a fabulous look at what the Apostle Paul says about the will of God and how we can know what God wants. How we can know the amazing, wonderful will of God. If you have a Bible with you tonight, I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Starts out this way. Therefore. Okay, let's stop right there. <laughs> let's stop right there. Because that's a fascinating word. Whenever you do Bible study and you run across the word therefore, it's a good idea to find out what it's there for. I was taught that in Bible school because when the word therefore appears, it, it, it suggests that there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened previous to that. And now we're responding to what happened previous to that. And what happened previous to this verse was 11 chapters proclaiming the unbelievable, wonderful, unconditional grace of God through Jesus Christ. 
all of my life, I think, even after I became a Christian, I, str I really worked hard to be good enough so that God would love me. And I was failing miserably. And there came a moment in my life when I was forced to glimpse at my own heart and see how dark it was. And I came to the conclusion, it was a very dramatic, a dangerous moment. I came to the conclusion that I didn't deserve to live. Uh, if I were to push that a little further, I'm ashamed to say I didn't want to live any longer and probably plan not to. In the darkest hours of my life, it was that grace that saved my life. It was that grace that turned my life around. It was that grace that allowed me to begin to walk a life of victory when before I had so desperately tried to be good enough so that God would love me. It was that grace that saved me what, from what I believe would have been a suicidal day when I suddenly realized that God knew about all my sins. He knew everything I had ever done. He knew about the darkness of my own heart. And he loved me anyway. That wonderful grace, the grace that did away with the law, that's what he's talking about here. Therefore, because of the amazing grace that God bestowed upon us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, therefore, I beg you. This is not a casual letter. This is not one of those letters that goes, how are you? I'm fine. It's raining here. I hope you're having sunshine. The kids are doing great. It isn't that kind of a letter. It is a letter filled with urgency. It says, therefore, because of the marvelous grace that God has bestowed upon us, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer him your body. Now, if you're taking notes, which I think would be a great idea, I'd like you to write down three suggestions that Paul gives that helps us understand what God wants, that helps us understand what the will of God is. And here's the first suggestion. Paul says, give God your body. That's how we came up with the title for this evening. God wants your body. You see, Satan loves generalities. Oh, he loves when we think just in general terms. Because then we're never specific enough to do anything. We talk easily about how God wants our life. I gave my, I gave my life to God. <laughs> well, what did you give him? I told you, I, I gave him my life. <laughs> no, no, your life is wrapped up in this package called a body. Very specifically, it's fascinating how Paul does away with all of that generality. Some of you may be saying, what's wrong with giving God my life? Absolutely nothing if you understand that that's a very specific gift and it's wrapped up in this body. The Bible says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. We love our bodies. We know about our bodies. I have two beautiful daughters, and they taught me more about the importance of body than anything else. Those girls used to take two days to get ready to go to school. They would spend hours with their bodies. Now, they didn't care about their rooms. <laughs> We had people come to our house and go, what is that smell? <laughs> I said, I have two daughters. They went, oh, okay. <laughs> I went down there one time. Rats and roaches and mice were coming out of their rooms with their suitcases going, we can't live like this no more. <laughs> see, see. 
See, that was their life. That was their life. But their body, oh my, they would, they would get up in the morning two, three hours before school and take a shower and then they would go about this business of getting the hair just right and they'd spray it and spray it. I spent a fortune on hairspray. I went into their bathroom. Their floor, you couldn't get your feet off their, their, their floor. Little bugs are going, help us, please. We're stuck here. We care about our bodies. We want to bring our bodies comfort. We want to make sure that, they're, that they don't hurt. If they're in pain, we will go to great lengths to alleviate the pain. Just the other night, I went to bed. Have you ever been so tired that your feet jump? <laughs> that is the most horrible, horrible thing. It's, it's kind of like we have sign language down here. When your feet jump, that's, your, that's sign language. <laughs> Tell them what it is, sign language. <laughs> it's your feet saying to your body, I got to go to sleep. <laughs> I must go to, go to sleep. Have you ever had nights like that? And then your brain is going, no. We're going to plan the rest of your life. And I was laying there twitching and jumping. And my stomach began to growl. My stomach said, I want water. You ate something bad. And I want... Am I the only one that does this? I want, I want water. Now, it didn't speak like that. It spoke in another language. It's just a grumbling. <laughs> in the original Hebrew, that means, give me water. I got up to go to the bathroom. And your body just has a whole conversation with itself. My toe said, turn on the light. <laughs> and my stomach said, no, just get to water. I really need the water. And I tried to make it into the washroom in the dark. And in the process, I slammed my toe against the corner of the molding going in the bathroom. And then my stomach said, forget the water, take care of the toe. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? If you read Romans 6, you will discover the most fascinating portion of Scripture that says that we are to offer the parts of our bodies as instruments to be used as holy instruments for God. And if we do so, the end result is life. Or we can offer our bodies to be used by Satan. And if we do so, the end result is there. Little kids sing a song. I don't know if you remember this song. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. How many remember that song? <laughs> oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, watch that toe. <laughs> That's about Romans 6. My entire life as a child was lived... Um, with the whole concept that God was up above waiting for us to mis make a mistake so that he could then punish us for whatever that mistake was. And that we had to be careful. It was kind of like, uh, be careful little hands what you do, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little feet where you go because Santa Claus is coming to town. And if you haven't done the right things with your hands, your feet, and your eyes, then there'll be no presence, there'll be no love, only punishment. The part of the song that blew me away was this phrase, for the Father up above is what? Looking down in love. The way I grew up, you would have sung that song this way. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. 
for the father up above will smash you like a bug. <laughs> it was the whole idea, the whole idea that God's job was to stand up in heaven and make sure that if we made a mistake, we were punished for it. The truth of the matter is that God's will is that you are centered in a relationship with Him and that you use your hands and your eyes and your mind. Every part of you belongs to God. Your sexuality, your intellect, all totally given to Him, all totally His. He wants it all. He wants to be the God not only of Sunday morning, He wants to be the God of the locker room. He wants to be the God at your job. He wants to be the God of your home. He wants every part of you to be used for His glory. If you want to know the will of God, give God your body. Look again at the passage. It says that we're to offer our bodies as a, and I love this, living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Now, friends, there are two words that don't go together. Living sacrifice. They don't go together. It's like pretty ugly. <laughs> those words don't go together. Jumbo shrimp. They're, those words don't go together. Living, sacrifice. There weren't a lot of sheep that came back from the sacrifice. None of them came back. I'll guarantee you, you would never find a sheep going, I was at the sacrifice last night. <laughs> they chose me. <laughs> oh, I'm a little burned out, but other than that. <laughs> a sacrifice was totally consumed. God does not want just a sacrifice. He does not want a dead sacrifice. In a few days, I'll be in the mountains with a bow and arrow chasing elk around. Elk that meet in groups at night and laugh until they're sick about my efforts. <laughs> Did you see the little fat guy with a pointed stick? One of the most amazing things for me are those clear crystal streams at the top of the mountain. There isn't a soul for a hundred miles to jump into one of those streams. I want to tell you, when you come out of that stream, you come out like an intercontinental ballistic missile. <laughs> and every fiber of your body cries out, we're alive. We are alive. There is nothing dead here. It is pure and it's clean and it's filled with life. On the other hand, sometimes you will find these little stagnant pools where no clean water is flowing in and there's no outlet to it and it's all dead and there's nothing attractive about that. I grew up in the kind of environment that taught that Christianity was a very dead sort of thing, a very Pharisaic, legalistic sort of thing. Basically, Christianity was a, a list of 10 or 15 things that you always do and nine nasties that you avoid at all costs. I grew up believing that if you didn't smoke, if you didn't drink, if you didn't chew, if you didn't dance, if you didn't go to the theater, if you didn't play cards, and it went on and on and on, that you were a good Christian. Now, I'm not endorsing any of those things. But at 16 years old, I was sitting on my porch one day, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. We had a collie dog named Ralph, and Ralph came walking by just just came walking by. Suddenly it dawned on me. Ralph didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't chew. He didn't dance. He didn't go to the theater. He never played cards. And we never let Ralph run around with dogs that did those things. <laughs> now listen to me. If just not doing those things makes you a good Christian, then the best Christians in the world are those mannequins. Because mannequins don't do anything. They must be marvelous Christians. 
They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't chew. They don't dance. They don't do any of the things. And for each of us, the list is different because of our background, and it goes on and on and on. And again, my argument isn't which things on that list are right or wrong. My argument is that that this whole thing about living sacrifice, the living part of that has to do with Jesus Christ. When you're plugged into Jesus Christ on a day-by-day basis, you're alive. It's about a relationship with Him. And when that relationship is gone, there's nothing to live for. I've been in countries that have a list longer and more strict than ours that know nothing of the love of Jesus Christ. God wants us to be a living sacrifice. Mannequins don't change lives because they're dead. I mean, they're not... See, I even did it there. I gave them more than they're worth. They, they never were alive. They're not dead. They're just there. <laughs> How many of you, right now, we'll have a testimony time. How many of you once were into alcoholism or perhaps you were a sinner and, and you were just about dead or you had given up on life and then you met a mannequin and they changed your life. May I see your hands, please? <laughs> Come on up and share your testimony, please. I can say that with confidence because no one has ever been changed by a mannequin. The only time you're even moved by a mannequin is that one little moment when you think it's alive. You know what I'm talking about? When you're walking down the store and you turn the corner and the mannequin is there and for a moment it looks alive. And then you realize it isn't. But you feel like a fool because you keep talking to it. I remember coming on a mannequin once and said, Oh, excuse me. And then I, oh, I'm sorry. And then I thought, this is a mannequin. I am continuing a conversation with a piece of plastic. (laughs) When Diane and I got married, I was wearing some of the finest clothes I had ever owned. We honeymooned in Canada. So we went into a department store and I thought, you know, I'm going to pretend I'm a mannequin. (laughs) So I just stood there like this. I would wait until people got two or three feet from me and I'd go, hi. (laughs) I want to tell you, people came unglued. (laughs) They turned inside out trying to get out of there. (laughs) One time I just stood there and a lady came up, true story. She was a very large lady, a beautiful lady. She came up and she had a marvelous accent. And she actually reached out and felt the material in my jacket. And she turned to a friend that was sitting, that was in an aisle three or four rows over, and she said, Hilda, she said, what do you think of this for my husband, George, this fabric? And I'm just sitting there, she's feeling the (laughs) fabric. And her friend shouted back, it's too young looking for George. And so the lady turned to leave. She put her purse on. She turned to leave. And as she turned to leave, her hand slipped off of the fabric on the, on the coat and rubbed against the warm flesh on the back of my hand. Her eyeballs got that big. You know how many coat racks that woman knocked over? And she's yelling, he's alive! Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The whole point of Romans, the whole turning point of Romans, it hinges on this one verse. From Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about the very thing that brings life to a sacrifice. The marvelous grace of God and the commitment of a man or a woman or a teenager to God. A person who is willing to say, here are my hands, here are my lips, here is my intelligence, my sexuality, my feet, my legs. Everything God I have belongs to you. I think the big idea behind the whole concept of us loving God, keeping His commandments, and His commandments not being 
uh, burdensome to us is that the more we love God, the more we're inside the center of his mill, will, the more we want to do what he wants. There's a verse in Proverbs that used to just kind of confuse me as a kid. It goes like this. Delight thyself in the law of the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, I used to, I used to think about that, and I used to think, well, you know, if I were to do that, would I be able to do these things? Until one day it hit me. If his law, if his will, if his desires become your desires, then these things no longer hold the same power and appeal that they once did. You want to please him. I want to please him. It's that day by day, minute by minute relationship with Jesus Christ that makes the difference. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of spiritual worship. The greatest worship you can offer to God will never be if you stand with your hands spread apart and pray to him. But your greatest spiritual act of worship is to take what he gave you and give it back to him. Give your body to God. The next step is this. God wants your will. Give your will to God. The Bible says this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. And I have a question for you tonight. Who owns you? Does your company own you? Do your church friends own you? Do your friends at school own you? Are they the ones who control and form and mold you into what you're going to be? In the worst hours of my life, in a backslidden condition, I sat in a hotel room in Atlanta, Georgia. I was getting ready to catch a plane putting my things together on a Sunday morning. And I turned on the television. And on the television was a documentary of Jim Elliott, a young man who right out of college decided that God could have everything, that God could have his hands, his eyes, his feet. A young man who decided that his will would not be controlled by a world who called him a fool at the time for the sacrifice he made, but instead would be controlled by a God who knew far more than he did and who loved him far more than the world did. I spent a good number of the years of my high school life trying to impress people who didn't care. Why waste four or five years of your life trying to impress, allowing people to mold you into a shape? People who the day you touch that diploma, you will never see again. I don't care what's written in the yearbook. The laughter is coming from the older people who, who, who wrote in there, we will be friends for life. And you have no idea where those people are now. You spent four of the best formative years of your life, allowing them to conform you into a shape they didn't even recognize, they didn't even care, and they no longer are even in your lives. Jim Elliott said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That young man left his wife and family and went down to, mission, to minister to the Aka Indians. He landed his little plane on that strip of beach and the natives came out, the natives that he loved, that he was trying to reach, those men came out of the woods with spears and killed those fellows right there. And the world called them fools. I remember I stood with my briefcase in one hand and my hand on the handle of the door and my feet gave out from underneath me. As I listened to the testimony of their wives, as I listened to the testimony of their classmates, and I crumpled to the floor and began to weep as this, he, this strong native man, still dressed in his native costume, 
stepped to the front and proclaimed the marvelous church that has been built there told about the worship that goes on every Sunday. He's one of the leaders in the church, and it was one of his spears that took the life from Jamelia. Let me ask you a question. If you were to wake up tonight and God was standing at the foot of your bed and you recognized him and he said, Hello, come with me. I'm going to show you a life beyond anything you can imagine. By the way, this isn't beyond possibility. He did it with the disciples. He walked down to the shore. He met with men that were the equivalent of today's longshoremen. These were not little geeky, nerdy guys. These were people who made their living from the sea, whose lives were threatened every single day. And he walked down there and he said, You, you, and you, follow me. There was none of this, excuse me, if you'd lay your nets down for a second, I thought we could negotiate something. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, follow me. And the Bible says they dropped their nets and followed him. They dropped their nets. Let me paraphrase. They dropped their entire means of living. They dropped everything that made them secure. If he appeared at your bedside tonight and said, come on, come on, Let's go. Give me your will. Give me your life. Come on. What would you say? I'm ashamed to tell you what I think I'd say. Um, <laughs> my house. I have a nice house. We just burned the mortgage. I just paid for this house, God. Come on, give me your will. Um, I have to sell some more tapes. <laughs> Come on. Are you with me? Let me tell you something. He's there. He's there. Right this moment, he is calling to each of you saying, give me your body. Give me your will. Trust me. If I call you to a direction that is the opposite of where you are headed now, trust me. God wants your body. God wants your will. You say, how do I give him my will? How do I take some of those steps? Well, one of the secrets is in the next point that Paul brings up. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give God your mind. Give God your body. Give God your will. Give God your mind. When Genghis Khan swept across the Far East, there were times when he trampled cities that had armies five or six times the size of his army. And one day, someone asked him, how is it possible? What is your secret for conquering the world like this? Especially when you walk into a place that has more strength and power than you have. And this was his answer. He said, we bribed the gatekeeper. We bribed the gatekeeper. I want to tell you, friends, your mind is the gatekeeper of your soul. And I'd like to suggest that one thing we as Christians need to do today is to at least put a guard there. There's nobody there to bribe. I believe that sometimes the reason we have a hard time finding out what the mind of God is is because we entertain ourselves with what breaks the heart of God. My father-in-law was in our home one day. The children were in their teens, and they brought home a video, and we began to watch it. And the longer the video ran, the more upset my father-in-law became. And finally, he just stood up and he said, how can you allow this in your home? And I became angry. I wanted to say, father-in-law, the operative words in that sentence are, your home. This is my home. He's such a dear man. He turned to me and he said, Ken, if someone like that came into your home and spoke those words to your children, if someone came in your home and acted like that right here in this room, what would you do? And defensively, I turned to my father-in-law. I said, I'd throw him out. 
And my father-in-law said, they're here. They're here. They just came in a different package. Somehow we tolerate on the television and we tolerate in the movies what we would never tolerate from a live person standing in front of us. I'm telling you something, friends. We don't need any political movements. We don't need people trampling across the country talking about the evils of what's on television. If we just put a guard at our mind and allowed the Word of God to guide us, we would be walking up to the television three or four times a day to shut the thing off. But we tolerate it. We allow the guard to fall asleep or be bribed and that stuff comes into our mind. And it works our way, its way into our lives. And we end up totally having a blurred vision of what God's will might be. We can't even discover God's will because we're polluted with what the world offers. You know I'm not a prude. I'm sure I've told stories and some of you went, Whoa, that was close to the line. <laughs> I never do that intentionally. What I'm trying to say is, you know that I'm not some kind of a weird person who doesn't enjoy life, but I'm telling you, we are destroying our society and our lives, and we are allowing the enemy right within our heart because of what we allow in our hearts and minds. We need to put a guard there. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 1, it says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he'll be like a stream, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, refreshed and clean, and everything he or she does will prosper. Not only do we need a guard at the gate, but we need to purify our hearts and purify our minds by allowing the Word of God to flow through us every day, every minute, every hour. Give God your body. Give God your will. Give God your mind. You say, what does all of this have to do with God's will? Listen to this. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Give God your will. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Give God your mind. Now listen to this. Listen to the transition. Then... Some of your translations say, so that. In other words, if you do this, this will be the result. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. I've lost track of the number of people who've come to me and say, I'm trying to make this decision between this job and this job. And I don't know, I have an idea, but I don't know whether it's God's will or whether it's my will. And some people lay out the most ridiculous fleeces you've ever heard of in your life to discover, uh, should I go out that door or should I go out that door? Should I walk home or should I drive home? Maybe God wants me to meet somebody walking home. I just don't know what to do. God's will isn't so much about should I go to this school or should I go to this school? Should I, should I go to this church or that church? Should I take that job or that job? What should I do? That isn't so much what God's will is about. That isn't where it starts. That's putting the horse before the cart. Um, that's putting the cart before the horse. <laughs> Okay, that's putting the horse before the feedback. Let me do it my own way, all right? <laughs> that isn't where you start with this. And we agonize and agonize over these little decisions, which tells me one thing. We are not prepared to know God's will. Paul says, give everything you are to God. Then you will know his will. Another place in scriptures it says this that he works in us both to do and to will of his good pleasure. In other words, when God has all of us, he makes us want what he wants. 
You don't sing that song just once and go, hey, oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. You know, you don't sing that just once and then, and then for you live happily ever after and the, and the scene closes and darkness comes into a little circle as you walk into the sunset. I say today, Lord, here's my lips. And tomorrow I say, I'm so sorry. Here they are again. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Here they are again. And each time he's there saying, I love you, I know, I'll help you. It's my will that you keep coming back to me. If my dear friend David had said to me, hold your message to a minute, and I couldn't have told any stories, I couldn't have made you laugh, here's what I would have said today. To you, my brothers and sisters, I would have said exactly what Paul said. Please. I beg you. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because of the forgiveness he has bestowed on us without condition. Because of the almighty mercy and grace God has overwhelmed us with. I beg you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Give God your will. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Put a guard there and don't allow the world to pollute what God intended to be pure and holy. Cleanse your mind with his word every single day. Then you will know what is God's perfect and acceptable and pleasing will. At the beginning of this message, I made a simple statement. I said to you, what does God want? Whether you're 80 or 18, whether you're 6 or 60, I want you to look at me right now because proclaimed from the Word of God, I want to answer that question. Here is what God wants. He wants you. Body, mind, will, spirit. He wants all of you. And if he has all of you, then with confidence, you can move forward because he will put within your heart a desire for what he wants. An old missionary came to our school one time. He said this. I'll never forget it. He said, the trouble with most Christians, he said, is that they have moss growing on their rears. <laughs> now, I want to tell you something. The dean of students sat up right straight. The word rear had never been mentioned in chapel before. <laughs> the man was not doing it to be uh, salacious. He was not doing it to be, if salacious is a real word, if it's not, then forget it. But he wasn't doing it for that reason. The reason the man was doing it was to make a point. He said, most Christians sit there all their lives in their pews saying to God, open a door, show me your will, open a door. This man had just returned from the mission field. He was still doing mission work. He was about 80 years old. He said, that's never been the way I operate. He said, God has owned me since I was 16. And I've been going 80 miles an hour ever since, saying to God, if you don't want me in there, shut the door. And then that dear old man went, there's no moss on this rear. <laughs> God wants you. There was no football, there was no basketball, there was no shuffleboard, there was nothing for me. And basically that was because I was born um, with the hand-eye coordination of a carp, a, a fish with lips. God has a sense of humor, and here's how I know he has a sense of humor. God has a sense of humor because he gave me an intensely competitive spirit. 
and nothing to carry it out with. And it was his will. That isn't what I do well. Um, that isn't what I would be happy with, I'm sure. It was all a part of what God knows is best. Right from the, right from the very beginning, he said, this man's a carp.